Today, the men and women of the United States Air Force honor all the Air Force prisoners of war and those missing in action during the Vietnam War. The presiding official for today's ceremony is the Chief of Staff, United States Air Force, General Mark A. Welsh III. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the arrival of the official party. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets' red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flank was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Oh, the land of the free and the Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Major General Howard D. Stendhal will now deliver the invocation. Let us all pray. God of all grace and reconciliation, the generations rise and pass away before you, yet you are everlasting. In our human imperfection, we struggle at times among nations resulting in conflict Yet in you do those who serve in uniform find their greatest strength, and you become the rest of those whose devotion to duty becomes complete and final. This morning you give, we give you our praise and thanks for the faithful who have served our nation in uniform, especially in Southeast Asia, and those beloved families at home who sent their loved ones for service. For those families who still endure a missing place at the table, an ache in the heart for one who has not returned from Vietnam and its environs, we beseech you with our sincerest intercession to comfort them in the knowledge of a grateful nation. Strengthen our enduring commitment of accounting for those unaccounted in this and every conflict that the mystery of uncertain grief may come to comforting resolve. Gather our resources in national defense that we may continue in fidelity to military service, such as those who served in Vietnam and other conflicts have modeled for us. Keep us faithful to our elected leadership, and above all to you, our creator, that our nation's military instrument of power continue its respected role of selfless service. 
May today's ceremony respectfully honor the model of our Vietnam veterans of service, whether returned home to loved ones or those prisoners and missing whom we yet mourn but gratefully honor. We submit ourselves to service, even as given unto you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. The flyover you just witnessed was performed by a B-52 assigned to the 5th Bomb Wing, Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. The B-52 aircraft started flying missions over targets in Vietnam in June 1965 and continued flying these crucial missions throughout the war. The venerable B-52 is one of the very few aircraft that flew in Vietnam and remains in today's active inventory. Ladies and gentlemen, the Director of Administration and Management, Office of the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Michael L. Rhodes. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary James, General Welsh. Thank you for conducting this ceremony. Truly appreciate it. To our distinguished guests from Congress, from the Department of Defense, and from Veterans Affairs, and especially including the national leaders of the National League of POW MIA Families, Vietnam Veterans of America, American Legion, and the Veteran of Foreign Wars. Also to the airmen, past and present, and all those who have served in our armed forces. And especially to our Vietnam veterans, particularly our former prisoner, Vietnam prisoners of war and their families, and the families of those still listed as missing and unaccounted for. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. It's an honor for me to be here with you today at this beautiful memorial that overlooks our nation's capital. On behalf of the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Carter, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, I have the singularly distinct privilege of overseeing the United States of America Vietnam War Commemoration. This commemoration is conducted through a tremendous staff of professionals in the Vietnam Commemoration Office, and I thank them every day for what they do. Congress authorized the Secretary of Defense to conduct a program to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. And we do this partnering with other federal entities, state and local governments, and private companies and organizations. When Congress authorized the commemoration, it established as the number one objective to thank and honor our Vietnam veterans and their families. And it particularly called out the personnel who were held as prisoners of war and those still listed as missing and unaccounted for in their families. On behalf of a grateful nation, in this commemoration, we thank the Vietnam veterans and their families for their service, their sacrifice, and their valor. I personally am tremendously committed to this commemoration, in part due to the fact that I have, in, in my opinion, the greatest of all Vietnam veterans living with me, my dad. He was then Sergeant First Class Jerry Rhodes, flying as part of an Army air crew, performing signals intercept operation with the Crazy Cats of the First Radio Research Company. A few years ago, on Memorial Day in 2012, the Secretary of Defense hosted a commemoration, uh, our commemoration's uh, inaugural event, and it held this at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. He was joined by the President, the First Lady, the Vice President, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, other senior civilian and military leaders, but most importantly, there were thousands of Vietnam veterans and their families. They were the real VIPs of the ceremony. That kicked off the initial phase of our commemoration effort. And now today, here in this time frame, actually starting in January, we begin the main phase. This is where we strive to thank and honor the 7.2 million living Vietnam era veterans and the families of nearly 9 million who served. As much as possible, we're trying to thank them in their hometowns. We're attempting to accomplish this through our commemorative partners, these are organizations of any size that commit to have two events a year, each year from 2015 to 2017, that focus on thanking and honoring. We have nearly 7,500 commemorative partners so far. That's hopefully at least 15,000 events a year all across America. And we're honored that the Headquarters Air Force is one of those commemorative partners, and we truly appreciate your efforts, your commitment, and today's wonderful and important ceremony. Thank you. This is what the commemoration is about, simply about thanking and honoring those who served with extraordinary courage and valor and their families, especially the families who still wait after many years. Our nation will never forget the hardships and cruelties that our prisoners of war bravely bore and the emotional heartache that the families of those still missing and accounted for continue to endure today. To all, we recognize your enduring service and your sacrifice. 
So I'll close by quoting part of the President's proclamation that was read by, at the inaugural ceremony by a Vietnam Medal of Honor recipient. I quote, while no words will ever be fully worthy of their service, nor any honor truly befitting their sacrifice, let us remember that it is never too late to pay tribute to the men and women who answer the call of duty with courage and valor. Also, let us renew our commitment to the fullest possible accounting for those who have not returned. So Secretary James, General and Mrs. Welsh, thank you for all that you're doing to care for our airmen and their families, past and present. And to all our Air Force veterans and family members, and to all veterans and family members, thank you for your service and your sacrifice, and thank you for supporting this ceremony today with your presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Air Force Chief of Staff, General Mark A. Walsh III. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of Secretary James, it is just such an honor to welcome you here to our memorial, especially for this purpose. And while we're here to lay a wreath in a moment for those Air Force POWs and MIAs from the Vietnam conflict, there are many others who served who didn't wear the Air Force uniform. So could I ask before we start all veterans from the Vietnam conflict, all services or civilian, uh, to please stand or raise your hand if you have trouble standing and just let us acknowledge you this morning. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank all of you for being here on this special day to remember and honor airmen who served and sacrificed in such an incredible and inspirational way. And I don't believe there's any better place to honor these airmen than right here. Looking at this beautiful memorial, looking over the Pentagon to our great nation's capital and surrounded by 400,000 fallen heroes. 50 years ago today, the United States kicked off Operation Rolling Thunder, led by a B-52 assault. Rolling Thunder was the first sustained aerial assault on North Vietnamese territory. The campaign would last three years. Air Force, Marine, and Navy air crews would destroy half of the bridges in North Vietnam, almost all of its petroleum storage capacity, and nearly two-thirds of its power plants. The U.S. would also lose more than 1,000 aircraft in that campaign. One of the first was an F-100 Super Saber, piloted by then First Lieutenant Hayden Lockhart. The young Air Force officer, after being shot down, evaded the enemy for a week before he was captured. He was the first Air Force prisoner of the Vietnam conflict and would remain a prisoner until his release on February 12, 1973, nearly eight years later. One of my most vivid memories is watching television coverage of the first group of POWs returning to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines in February of 1973. I remember lots of things about that coverage. I remember the signs in the crowd at Clark Air Force Base. I remember the commentators talking way too much. I remember the shots of the C-141 taxing into its parking spot in front of the crowd. I remember watching the POWs come down the steps of that C-141 one at a time. And I remember their pride. Even those whose injuries made it impossible for them to stand fully at attention somehow did it when the band played the national anthem. With many of you and the rest of the country, I watched as 566 military prisoners of war returned to the United States over the next several weeks. Among them were Congressman Sam Johnson, Colonel Lee Ellis, Rear Admiral Bob Schumacher, and Commander and now the Honorable Everett Alvarez, Jr., all of whom join us this morning to remember their brothers in arms. Gentlemen, there is no way to repay you for your service or your sacrifice, but we would like to show our respect and our appreciation. <laughs> Through the wonder of television back in 1973, we rejoiced together as we watched these heroes reunite with their families. I remember watching as one POW on crutches 
with a severely damaged leg, embraced his wife and two children. Their third child, a young girl who had probably never seen her father before, kept her distance. I remember seeing him hand his crutches to his wife, balance on his one good leg, and reach toward his young daughter with both arms. I remember seeing my dad's eyes fill with tears as we watched in our living room. And I remember quietly begging her to go to him from thousands of miles away. And while I don't remember ever seeing her take a step, suddenly she was in his arms. I remember how I cried. For those of you who didn't serve as prisoners of war, would you humor me for just a moment and close your eyes with me and just imagine a small filthy cell, a rotting cage, unbearably hot during much of the year, unbearably cold the rest of the time. Imagine the loneliness, the belief that no one knows, no one cares, no one can help. Imagine the despair that brings. Imagine the persistent deep anguish of untreated injuries and disease, the inconsolable ache of a spirit bruised by relentless, brutal interrogation. Imagine the sharp, jagged pain of the last beating and the all-consuming fear of the next one. Imagine the certainty that no one can save you and the small, flickering hope that somehow they will. And behind all those things, like wallpaper you can somehow see in the dark, imagine the memories. Your dad's proud face and your mom's tears as you said goodbye. Your daughter's first smile. Your son's first step. Your wife or husband's face in the candlelight. Ladies and gentlemen, you had your eyes closed for two minutes. Many of the airmen we honor today and those sitting here today lived with those thoughts for six, seven, eight, even longer years. For those who died in captivity, these were their last thoughts. Among those airmen was an Air Force captain named Ron Storrs, a member of the famous Alcatraz 11, along with Admiral James Stockdale, Rear Admiral Schumacher, and Congressman Johnson. Captain Storrs had a reputation, even among the strongest of warriors, as a tough man. Admiral Stockdale wrote, each member of the Alcatraz 11 fought his war well from a filthy cell. All but one of us, Ron Storrs, came home alive. Ron was a tiger to the end. For us, he will always remain a symbol of courage, fidelity, and dedication. But to his daughter, Monica, who joins us today along with her husband, Henry Lavelle, he was so much more than that. Monica, thank you for being here to represent your dad and to celebrate his memory with us. And thank you for your sacrifice. We are all so very sorry that you lost him. Would you mind standing so we can honor you? Thank you. Among those who did return was Captain Alan Brudno. Captain Brudno's F-4 was shot down in October of 1965. He endured seven and a half years of captivity and returned with honor on 12 February, 1973. But the years as a POW had changed him. Post-traumatic stress didn't have a name in those days and the resources to cope with it were hard to find. Captain Brudno's resilience had been tapped out in the prisons of North Vietnam. And four months after returning home, he took his own life, a tragedy for his family and the nation. He was the first of our 566 returning POWs to do so, but sadly, not the last. Captain Brudno is an American hero. He wore two silver stars, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Legion of Merit, two bronze stars with combat valor device, and two purple hearts. His death led to a focus on what these great Americans were facing on their return from combat, a focus that has undoubtedly saved an untold number of lives of returning service members over the past 15 years.
Captain Brudno's brother Bob and his wife Sheila are with us today. Bob, would you and Sheila please stand? Thank you for your service as a naval officer. Thank you for carrying your brother's story forward. It's inspiring and it has saved countless lives. Prisoners of war are not a new heartache, even for this relatively young country. Since the Revolutionary War, almost 550,000 Americans have served as POWs. In the conflicts those years represent, there have also been thousands of American men and women at arms whose fate remains unknown. About 1,630 of them in Vietnam alone. 512 of those are airmen. Imagine now that you're watching the homecoming scene I described before and that the face you're praying to see doesn't come down those stairs on the first aircraft or the second one or the one after that. Imagine that there is no joyful reunion, no tearful hug, nothing, but a deep, dark hole in your heart where love somehow lives on with a tiny dim light to keep it warm. Here too, there is a never ending collage of memories. The day you met, the way he smiled, how proud you were that he was your dad. Your last lingering goodbye that now must last a lifetime. Maureen Kozak knows exactly what I mean. Her father, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Cook, was shot down over North Vietnam on November 10th, 1967. He was listed as missing in action. The family hoped against hope that he would step off one of those C-141s, but he didn't. It wasn't until 1976 that Lieutenant Colonel Kick Cook was declared killed in action, and the family learned that he died from his injuries shortly after being shot down. Maureen, thank you for being here to represent your father and to allow us to honor both him and you. Would you mind standing for a moment? This is a solemn occasion, but it's also a very proud celebration because we share the heritage of the brave Americans we honor today. We stand humbled yet inspired by the courage of their families and we carry with us the honor they brought to our ranks through their service and their sacrifice. As we go about the daily business of living up to their legacy, I'd like all the airmen in this audience to do me a favor. Sometime today, write their motto on a small piece of paper and put it in your wallet or in your purse. And every time you notice it in the future, take it out, unfold it, and read the words. Return with honor. Then put it back and quietly thank the heroes we honor today for doing exactly that and recommit yourself to making those great airmen as proud of us as we are of them. Mr. Rhodes, please join General Welsh as we prepare to present the wreath. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness an Air Force wreath laying ceremony. The wreath will be placed by General Welsh and Mr. Rhodes. In keeping with the conduct of this ceremony, it is our desire to maintain an atmosphere of dignity and respect. It is requested that everyone remain silent and standing. It is appropriate for military members in uniform to render the hand salute on the first note of taps. It is also appropriate for civilians to place their right hand over their heart. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise.
This concludes today's ceremony. Thank you for joining General Welsh in remembering and honoring our Air Force Vietnam veterans, prisoners of war, and those missing in action.